Hi everybody. I'm Louis Anthony, cousin Vinnie Agnello, and I am the author of the cult classic, The Devil's Glove. It's a book of faith, it's a book of spirituality, and a very uplifting book with a very, very moralistic message and story to it. Um, I, uh, in 2014, I um, traveled 27 states, uh, was featured and reviewed in 20 of them as I went on this amazing journey to get this story out to people who needed it. The apathetic, the disillusioned people in this country who need something to believe in. And I believe that this book will bring you to God if anything's going to. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the book because, hey, it may not be your cup of tea, but if it is, you certainly um, you will enjoy it. Um, let me, uh, right off the bat, tell you about what the book's about. The promo copy says, Dispirited by years of disappointment, minor league baseball player Billy Green summons a mysterious stranger who promises to help him cheat his way onto the big stage of Major League Baseball, if he lives up to the terms of a nefarious agreement, that is. At first, Green complies, but later reneges, creating the catalyst that propels the action forward in this modern-day morality tale that pits God versus Satan in a battle over the soul of an innocent boy who stumbles across Green's cursed baseball glove. A timeless tale that will renew your faith in God and human nature. Well, let me tell you about some of the national reviews of the Devil's Club. Can you imagine that? A national reviews. Well, you know, this is not a self-published book, so you get reviews. The um, Sun Herald of Gulfport and Biloxi, Mississippi, they said that it's part inspirational and it's part cautionary and a whole lot of baseball. The Devil's Glove promises to delight readers with its language and plot. The Danbury, Connecticut News Times came up with his knowledge of coaching and baseball makes the plot all the more compelling. And the Omaha World Herald, home of the College Baseball World Series, Omaha, Nebraska, and they checked in saying, it's an easy and entertaining read and has garnered much kudos on Amazon and on Facebook. I think best of all, though, was a review from a fan from Indianapolis, Indiana, calling themselves SG. And um, I've been using this to pitch the book to movie companies, so I thought that SG was incredibly intuitive. And what they said is that the book is about with promises of earthly glory on the baseball diamond, the devil posing as the manager has enticed an aging, naive, perennial minor league baseball player into wearing a magic glove in order to make it into the major leagues. The ball player soon becomes disillusioned with the deal with his deal with the devil, and he chooses death to break his pact. But the devil doesn't let him off the hook so easy as he imprisons his soul at hell's doorstep a dark and dreary abandoned baseball stadium after 39 long years of loneliness there. He's manipulated into leading a team of the damned into corrupting an innocent boy who just found his old magic glove. This young, awkward, impressionable boy is enticed to forego his earthly blessings for a shot at the major leagues and the magical glove he found becomes the instrument by which the devil progressively influences him to commit unconscionable acts against his teammates and his friends. 
As the boy approaches the point of no return, former baseball greats like Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth, who now dwell in the light, step forward and exert their influence in an attempt to pull the boy back into the light. Even one of the devil's own players is plagued by conscience and passively tries to redirect the boy while appear, appearing to be a solid member of the devil's team. As the battle for the boy's soul becomes more and more intense, players on both teams exert their influence until the boy finally sees for himself that the, what the devil has been enticing him to do is wrong. The book moves rapidly, the dialogue is intense, and once you start reading it, it's kind of hard to put it down. Highly recommend it. I appreciate these kind of reviews. They, uh, this person seems to know my book better than I do, but I'm now giving away my secret. I wanted to tell you about the, uh, the amazing story that they had in Ad Week which was the national publication. If you don't know anything about Ad Week, uh, Ad Week, uh, when Blue Bloods, the new television show comes on, they have on your television screen, it says, Ad Week says chic, or whatever Ad Week says. You know, not many people get Ad Week, and especially not many people get a feature in Ad Week from a small press like Tate Publishing, which is my publisher for this first original inaugural book, The Devil's Glove. So, and it's probably why it's a cult classic instead of a major New York, New York Times bestseller, to be honest with you. Anyway, in Ad Week, Richard Horgan from the National Publication said, if you've forgotten or never read about Agnello's incredible life story, do yourself a favor and take the time to digest the details of Savannah Morning News entertainment writer Linda Sickler's profile piece. He follows by saying Sickler isn't kidding when she leads with the idea that this cousin's experiences would make a great movie. What kind of experiences are they talking about? Well, I guess that would have to be about my crazy life. I was the uh, burlesque king. I worked with... Uh, Downtown Chad Brown. Downtown Marty Brown. He is downtown Chad Brown was the poker star from the World Poker Tournament. And after that, I did soap operas, spit parts on One Life to Live, Guiding Light, Ryan's Hope. I've um, appeared in, in uh, movies. I've been on uh, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, Regis Philbin, Kathy Lee Gifford, um... Amazing stuff, featured in CNN, but the most important thing I ever did, my lead role, was this book, The Devil's Glove. So tonight, I'm going to read a start a series, which is basically set up just to tease the crap out of you, okay? And it's going to. I'm going to read probably half of this book. Not tonight, I won't. We're going to do uh, chapter by chapter little segments to tease you, and after we get you about halfway into the book, you're going to understand why this book is so vital, so important, and so intriguing. And right now, it's Sister, the uh, sequel to The Devil's Glove, called The Revenge of the Manager, is on uh, the Kindle Scout website, okay, being nominated for a big contract with... Uh, with Amazon. Anyway, so tonight, let's get uh, started with The Devil's Glove. Now you know whether or not uh, it, this, this book will pique your interest, and we will start with Chapter 1. You know, when you're an author, you have no idea how many times you read your own book. I've probably read this book ridiculous, but no, I don't mem I haven't memorized it. But uh, the quotes up front are very important. In The Devil's Glove, the first quote you're going to hear is that, is that a person's soul cannot move on until his body has been discovered. Death must never be left to speculation. Well, that's from folklore. 
And the second quote to introduce the book is, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That's from Hebrews 13 to the Bible of all places. Our first chapter, The History of Michael and Billy. It was the most restless night he had ever spent. He pretended to sleep, although in reality his mind was in overdrive, as he tossed and turned repeatedly. All he could think about was his boy and the sequence of events that played out during that baseball game. Something extraordinary had taken place the night before, and morose thoughts filled his consciousness. Something was definitely wrong. A primordial sense of doom overwhelmed his psyche. Frustrated, he glanced over at the nightstand where his alarm clock sat. It was six in the morning. This was much too early for him to start his day, considering the fact that the game wasn't starting until late in the afternoon. But this was not an ordinary day. Being the chief groundskeeper for Comiskey Park for many years now, he thought he needed to make a trip over there and try to figure out Billy's whereabouts. He couldn't find him after the game, and that was troubling him. Where could he have gone without changing his clothes, he thought. As far as he could tell, Billy was still wearing his Chicago White Sox uniform. Now why would he do that? There were just too many questions and just not enough answers. He was totally frustrated as he climbed out of bed and gazed into the mirror. Taking in the reflection of a man who looked completely helpless. Although bewildered for the time being, he knew one thing for certain, and that was he had to find Billy. Billy Green was the son he never biologically fathered, but who shared such an amazing spiritual affinity with him that all who knew them believed they were kin. Michael, for all intents and purposes, had practically raised the boy, who, by the way, was now almost 32 years old and a full-grown man. He was also the apple of Michael's eye, being a baseball player. If the truth is to be told, he was living for the most part Michael's dream. Michael always wanted to be a ball player, but being clumsy with both hands did not help him achieve this lofty goal. Billy, on the other hand, did not, did not have this problem. His coordination was just fine. He had three major problems, though. First of all, he was chronically inaccurate when it came to throwing runners out. Secondly, he threw the ball with his left hand, which is a monumental problem for a third baseman because while throwing a runner out at first base, he always had his back turned to home plate. This second problem became larger as he moved closer and closer to the major leagues. It is very bad to have your back turned to runners who could very easily race home while you're throwing to first. Lastly, due to being left-handed and playing third base, most balls he had chances to field were hit to his left, which made him have to field almost every ground ball backhanded. Backhanding balls is much more difficult than fielding them with the forehand. These fielding promise problems were his undoing, and he just couldn't overcome them, especially with his throwing woes. Because of these problems, he had been knocking on the door of big league success for too many years to count, and always falling just short. Michael marveled at the kid's fortitude and his perseverance. Michael had the good fortune 
to witness the boys' transformation into a major league prospect. Throughout their many years together, the boy became rather adept at the game they both loved so much. Since Billy was old in baseball terms, time was no longer his ally. And this was the stress of his life. This stress was compounded by his poor performance in his first major league game last night. Just when everyone was convinced that he had overcome his throwing woes, he somehow regressed. His overall play, especially his defense, was abysmal, and everyone knew